Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Apparently, there's like a 1,000 people online that are watching this, so I'll try to continue to make this as interesting as possible, um, even without the crowd support. I was hoping to do a crowd wave with you guys, but that's not going to happen. Um, so uh, who, I am? who am I? Uh, my name is Brian Geraldo. I'm the vice president uh, for the office of the CTO uh, for Fidelis. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been in, uh, I was born overseas. I was actually born in, uh, in, in Panama and raised between Italy, Germany, the United States, and Panama. So um, I started in development, like most people. Um, I've been doing this for 23 years, 24 years almost. And 19 years of that has been in uh, security. Um, my focus has been on ethical hacking work, like a lot of the previous speakers. Um, and so I've seen a lot of different things. I guess a little bit of interesting information. Uh, these are the companies I work for. So, um, you know, I started doing uh, security for, uh, f uh, before even at, when I was working at uh, British Petroleum. I used to actually do the development for the, um, the systems that were going out to the oil rigs <clears throat> and managing them and figuring out how to fix the applications that were working with them to make sure the transactions were reliable. And then uh, before that, a federal bank in the United States. And then um, for after that, uh, Lucent Technologies. Uh, I, I was one of the first employees for Riptech, which is the first MSSP that was ever created. Um, they were bought by uh, Symantec. And then I was moved to a team called At Stake. If you guys know who At Stake is, At Stake is actually the guys from Cultivated Cows. So, um, you know, I came at the end of when those guys were leaving, um, but I did work a little bit with some of those guys, uh, and they're interesting to work with. And they rip you apart technically if you don't know what you're doing. So, um, furthered my career quite a bit just doing that. Um, I built Symantec's uh, global power and energy critical infrastructure uh, ethical hacking team. Uh, and then after a while, uh, when Symantec bought Veritas, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to work there anymore, so I left and started my own company for 10 years. So the previous speaker, I think, talked about building the company. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us have, because there's a lot of, there's very few people that actually can do this work well. And so the people that do the work well um, tend to have consulting firms. So uh, finally, after 12 years of owning my own company, I went to Anomaly. I ran their research team. So all the guys that do malware analysis, reverse engineering, all that, all that work, that was uh, part of the team that I was involved in and helped, um, uh, as well as just uh, providing services for clients. And then finally, I moved to Fidelis. And honestly, I moved to Fidelis for three reasons. One, I saw the product, and I was like, wow, this, so the previous speaker talked about everybody saying that there's products out there, and everybody, you know, the products are, are interesting, or they say that they do certain things. The reason I came here is much like a, a pen tester that you can do, that I, that I, who I appreciate, who does, does their job well. The only thing I can say about this product is it actually does its job well. It's not vaporware. It doesn't claim to do things that, it, you know, it just works, and it works well. So I came to this company because of that and because of my other technical friends who also came there to work. So they showed me the product, and I was like, wow, this is actually very good. So here I am. Um, two more pieces of information about me. I uh, play the cello, and my two favorite books are Dune and War and Peace. And none of, them, none of that information is going to help you break into anything that I have because I don't use anything like that for my, any of my credentials. You think so. <laughs> oh, I don't. I, use, I randomly generate everything. So um, let's talk about the agenda. So the agenda is about knowing the terrain. I'm going to, do, I'm going to show you some statistics. I'm going to do some attacks um, that I'm going to show you. I'm going to explain to you attacks against the IT and OT environment. I'm going to show you how shifting from prevention to detection is the, fo is some, is, is the focus of what's going on now. Um, because prevention was the old method. It's been around for a long time. And uh, how does it work, right? Right now, prevention is still allowing a lot of people to break into these environments. And detection is, augments prevention in a lot of ways and provides the necessary agility you need using things like threat hunting to look for bad actors. And then finally, solutions for OT and IT that you can use. So let's quickly talk about knowing the terrain. I'm not going to show you these. I'm not going to talk about these two, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the quotes. Uh, I have Napoleon here, and I have Sun Tzu. Every security person in the world uses Sun Tzu, and, the, and it's for a good reason, right? Uh, we are at war with people that we're fighting against. However, um, I also you know, recognize Napoleon was a great general and a great field general at, at understanding terrain. And so this is his quote on that. 
And again, I'm not going to read this to you. These presentations are going to be available at some point, then you can read it yourself. But it's essentially, you need to know your terrain. That's the focus. You really need to understand it. And I'll give you some examples. So, um, so let's start with statistics. First of all, 69% of respondents, we did a survey for clients last year, and 69% of respondents in this very large survey stated that they really see that their train is expanding, right? They're adding new systems, bring your own devices, um, sometimes IoT, sometimes OT, um, sometimes uh, marketing wants to sh set up a rogue or a shadow system to do some type of marketing event, and they don't want to have to go through the entire security process and change management. So, so there's all these issues with, uh, with the terrain and the expansion of the terrain. At the same time, there's a very strong lack of visibility. 49% of responders say that they cannot or have no real idea of what everything that's going on within their, within their environment. They lack the confidence to be able to present this um, to, to stay to their upper management. I know where every system is, and I know the potential impact of these systems, right? So again, another uh, statistic, another, uh, we did, a, this was tied to a very long evaluation that we did with quite a few clients, prospects, and people in the industry at various conferences like, like uh, RSA. And so these, this was the result of that information, which I think is very telling. It really tells you, look, visibility is a huge, huge concern, right? So how best for, to protect this? Um, really, the protection, it's, it's multi-layered. Uh, I would say that one area that I, that I completely agreed with the previous speaker was it is you have to really understand the multiple facets of these environments. Um, and I'll, again, I have an example of that. Your asset, your network terrain, everything that's tied to your infrastructure, threats that are targeting your environment, you have to understand that from a threat intelligence perspective, you have to understand that by sharing information with your IR team, with a SOC team, and with the people that are actually doing hunting. So um, your data, right? Your internal data and how you're looking at that data to, be, to allow you to be able to understand where the activity is coming from. Um, one of the presentations that I, or uh, the hunting sessions that I did for clients recently, I asked clients one simple question. I said, hey, what's the, one of the first things that you're gonna ask somebody when you're trying to hunt for activity on a Windows Active Directory environment? And I asked people to tell me. Well, most people couldn't tell me. Well, one of the five questions I ask is how many Active Directory servers you have and where are they located? Because if you understand how Active Directory works and you don't have a centralized way to log, and he's smiling in the front row, he knows. If you don't know how to way to log events in one correlated way, what will end up happening is if somebody is logging into the Active Directory server in Riga, the people that are in Poland are not going to be able to see the authentication unless they're actually going to that Active Directory server, right? There's no really centralized way to do this because you're authenticating to your local Active Directory environments. And so one of the things I always ask clients is, where's, where are your Windows logs? How are you looking at these logs? Are they, where are your domains associated? Do you have any type of centralized logging system? Now they're doing it. It took tool, you know, now they're doing it with Sims and with other products, but it, it's been a slow battle, right? Um, and then adversaries and, you know, some of the things that you, that you need to understand is some of the behaviors. I'll give you an example of a very simple behavior as an, atta as an attacker that I tell clients as part of threat hunting. When I get into a Linux system, one of the very first things that I do is I run history, I run who am I, the who am I command, or, and, and I run different types of Etsy, catting Etsy password, catting Etsy, um, catting the Etsy shadow, catting the Etsy resolve.conf. You can't, oftentimes, you, obviously, you can't do the shadow, but, um, and the Etsy resolve.conf. Now, if you, the reason why is this, because I need to understand the system that I've broken into. So as a behavior rule, when I'm looking at behaviors and patterns of activity, you have a network connection, right, from somebody, and you don't know where that system is coming from, and then you immediately after that have certain steps that that person takes because they always will have to do the same steps. I always have to understand my environment. That's how attackers think. That's how I did this for 20 years. It doesn't change. I need to understand the environment so that then I can con continue to expand the terrain and attack more. So you need to have tools that allow you to understand behavior, right? So I would create uh, a rule that would do a network connection. I would create another rule that would say, okay, now give me behavioral information tied to anybody that's doing any cat, catting the Etsy um, resolve.com, for instance, the Etsy password file, um, or that is actually running 
uh, catting the, the dot bash uh, profile, dot bash underscore profile. So all those things are very important as part of this. So, you know, um, actually this is the same slide. Uh, that's fine, I made a mistake there. So let's talk about use cases. And once I go through these use cases, you can understand when I talk about understanding your terrain. So the very first profile that we have here is a large natural gas company. We did a very large uh, ethical hacking effort project for them. The testing objective was, can you demonstrate that production can be affected without affecting any OT client efforts, right? So this is, if you know how natural gas works, you have wells out on the field, you have a back-end control system, and you can see it here. You can actually see the, the way it's set up is you have the, the wells, the back the gathering pumps, the production wells, and then you have a back-end control system here, right? You also have sometimes back-end control systems that are tied at the gathering station. So we tested this from the outside. We tested it from the inside. It's using a non-standard protocol. A lot of it is serial. We couldn't get in. So what did I do? I, I wasn't forgetting very much. Uh, I wasn't getting in in the way I wanted to. So I started looking around, and we realized that um, uh, we could, you, you, when I was looking for the errand information for the client, that they actually had errand information that was not only their information, but it actually talked about the telecom vendor that they were using for communication. I took that information down, and then I started triangulating that with IP and for geo IP information, so I could grab all of the different errand information that was tied to geo IP information, and I knew which parts of the network, the externally facing network, were actually tied to GPRS activity potentially. And then I started, I started scanning it. And what I determined was, it, based on that, is that I was able to get access to the, cell, the various cell towers, right? I got access to the cell towers that were internet-facing GPRS IP address systems. Um, I was able to use a local file inclusion vulnerability that I found on, on those systems. And I was able to give myself full administrative credentials on those systems from the internet. Once I had full administrative credentials to those systems, I tested those credentials, and they were the same credentials that were used for the entire cell tower. So now I had access to all the cell towers. Now I che te checked everything, and everything was tied. It was actually, there were multi-home systems, so they were actually tied to the client's production side. And the reason I knew that is because I had the client's banner and banner information on the other side of this multi-home connection. So at the end of the day, what were we able to do, right? Although the, cl the client owned a closed network, that closed network was very much tied to the infrastructure that they said we wouldn't gain access to. We were able to show at an attack that took advantage of the fact that they did not understand their own terrain and did un not understand that they had a multi-home system, and we gained access. And from there, I was able to show the client hey, we have full control, what can we do with this? And they said, well, you could knock down all of our telemetry coming in from all the way out there. And these are, when I mean long haul, this is GPRs. These are miles and miles away. Some of them were in other parts of, like, uh, hundreds of miles away, right? So, you know, keep that in mind. That's understanding your terrain. Now let me take you to a second example. And I'm trying to make sure that I, I hit my time here. Um, so the second one is another use case, and after this use case, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna show you a video tied to this use case of attacking a PLC. Um, uh, and then from there, I'm gonna show you how to actually look for the first part of this attack, which was this effort right here, right? So, so the profile was another natural gas company. Um, can we attack and gain access to their natural gas wonderware system in the control center? What can we do with that? So what we did is we used multiple different attacks. We gained access to their network. There's like three different ways that we did it. Um, it included sending some people a malicious MS. Uh, we actually broke in using a web application vulnerability, uh, phishing attack, um, and then we also used uh, an attack where we came in through uh, uh, a system from another vendor. So we had three different ways that we actually got into this environment. The one I'm gonna to talk to you about is the, the phishing one because it's just the most simple one to do right now. And honestly, I built this presentation at three in the morning. So <laughs> you guys, hopefully you like what I put together in th at three in the morning. Um, so um, when we had, so what, we, what we did is once we got access to the, this environment, the next step was gaining access to the Windows Active Directory. We laterally moved. 
we looked and found that Citrix, that was actually Citrix groups tied to the control system environment, um, by then I already had credentials to the environment, so I used those credentials to actually get onto one of these Citrix boxes. Um, the Citrix boxes that were tied to the control group, the control systems group, one of them actually had access to an RS Links box. RS Links, which I'm gonna show you in the next presentation, um, my colleague, uh, who's uh, the vendor of uh, Corpus uh, in, uh, in, in, in Prague, uh, in the Czech Republic, he was the one who, we, the, the, he helped me with this attack that I'm gonna show you. So anyway, so once, we got, uh, once I got access to the local RS Links box, then I was able to use those credentials to then use a different system that had RDP access and RDP into the system. What was I able to do with that? If you, look at the uh, if you look at the impact, the overall impact was that the client said, first of all, I felt really bad because we were doing this test and we generally never test during what we call peak production hours, winter, summer, because that's a problem. Because of the, 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 the upper management asked us to test during peak, uh, peak production hour, I was very worried about making sure that we did not affect operational reliability or availability of the systems. If you know about control systems, you know that's a big thing. So, Anyway, what we ended up doing was uh, the, the, uh, the supervisor for the control system was very upset. And I said, look, we're going to get all the way to the point where we can log in with admin access to the, uh, to the Wonderware system if we can, and then we'll stop. So we had full admin access to the box. We were able to start up the, the Wonderware software. We had full admin access to that. And, um, and I said, what can we do with this? Well, you can knock down everything of mine. You can knock down, and I said, how? Because at that point, I had not worked that much with liquid natural gas or natural gas, especially on the distribution side. He said, well, if you change the, um, the, way, uh, uh, the way control systems work, it's based off of getting different ohms. Different ohms tell you the different telemetry limits and settings for, based on pressure, temperature, yada, 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 right? So if we change the pressure on this, what happens with a, with a natural gas environment is you reduce the pressure, uh, if you go to your house and you smell where natural gas is, the reason why it smells so strong is because it has a high level of pressure. It's actually pushing air, trying to make sure that air doesn't get introduced. The moment you reduce the pressure, you introduce oxygen into a pipeline. If you introduce oxygen into a gas pipeline, that means that they have to close that segment of pipeline to clean it, the entire thing, and use something called a pig, which is a gigantic eraser. <laughs> That's what it looks like, except it's mechanical. But anyway, to get in. So this is the actual attack. Um, I'm showing you, that's me, because I couldn't find another, uh, another uh, I hate using the hoodie thing, but that was the only one that I had um, that I created last night. So look, let's look at the steps. One, I sent a malicious, uh, malicious email. I, was make I made sure that I used an obfuscated version of MS Word. I made sure that I used an, an encoded methodology so that it would bypass the, um, the email gateway. I used DKIM and SPF so that it would bypass any of the, any of the security measures that are tied to DNS. And it went through the email and it got to a user. From that user, they clicked on the malicious Word document and then from there, um, it made a connection back to me, which then I had full control of that workstation. After I had full control of that workstation, actually it kicked off a couple of different scripts when it did it. Um, then I went and I started attacking the corporate network. That's number five. Um, I was able to find the group. Um, and then from there, and I think I, I, uh, number six was finding the group and then number seven was me gaining access to the RDP server that I found that then allowed me access into the Wonderware environment. So that was the attack. Um, before, and I, before I do the presentation, I want to do a disclaimer. I don't take credit for other people's work. Corpus was very help, help, was fantastic in helping me with this. They actually build their own control system uh, uh, lab for testing security um, in Prague. I was in, the, they build their own micro, uh, micro devices. The, the guys there are, are, know their stuff from an IT and OT perspective which I was, I was uh, very impressed with. And usually these days, I'm not that impressed with people. So what, what I'm gonna show you is a video that we put together. And that video really talks about uh, and shows you the type of attacks and how they work, as well as how you stop that very first step that, um, that I was involved in. So let me go ahead and launch this. All right, so let me see here. Let me see if I can make it. All right, so, uh, yeah, let me make sure that, and then uh, let me make sure no sound. Okay, so, so this is an RS Lynx device. RS Lynx is a product that's used by companies like Rockwell Automation. 
it allows you to, and again, this is Corpus using RS links to connect to a Rockwell PLC. As you can see from the PLC, they've actually added pumps. They've actually the, the, added the, the ability to get information. If you look in the top corner right there, you can see that it's actually running and you're getting telemetry information from the PLC and from the, art, uh, from the, from the field devices. So the, we started this process by making sure that everything worked. So once everything we knew that everything worked, the next step was to actually start the process of testing it. You can see that the PLC is working, as I mentioned. This may go a little slow. I may speed it up a little bit, just because I want to, again, I'm mindful of other people's time. So um, next thing is, now, they switch, now, we, now we're switching to Kali. We're just switching to a Linux instance. And you can see here that um, we start to kick off an Nmap session. I don't actually use the Zenmap. I, I like Nmap, the uh, command line. But you know, yeah, we were just showing. This is a good way to show this information. I think it works re really well. So we start scanning the PLC. And it's going to go through the whole process of scanning it. And here are the end results, right? We have scanned this entire process control network um, to look for information. As you can see here, and I'm going to just speed it up a little bit, we do a quick scan, and we get down here, and you can see that, look, this is a Rockwell application, right? So now we have, we, we've shown that we have, we, 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 this is identified as Rockwell. So the next thing is to just start the process of taking a look at this. Metasploit is running on this in a way, but there's think, something that's very important here. When he does this, when, when the guy who did this with me, he actually had created his own control connectivity using Python. So he was actually knocking the PLC down with Python. And I'm trying to prove a point here. So you see that there was a script that was run to actually start the pump. And the pump ran. And it was pretty fantastic to see the pump running. You know, you can tell that there was communicating effectively, which was great. So, but the thing that I think is very interesting is, is that nowadays, because there's all these tools out there, you don't necessarily need somebody with control system experience, because Metasploit and other tools are already available. GitHub, there's a lot of different resources with information that's tied to accessing and testing PLCs. So you can, and you don't see this in the video, and I'll show you, it's going to switch over. But you can see him launching a different attack. This is an attack he's doing, and it's actually not the PLC, but the controller that's actually the, the um, the device that's associated with the PLC, and he starts attacking it. So while he's attacking, while he's attacking that, I, I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm, I'm looking at the controller. I'm looking at everything that's going on. It goes on for a little bit. Keep going. I'm going to move it on a little bit faster because it takes a little bit of time. As you can see, these are all uh, different types of commands that are being run to it. A lot of times, the commands are very ladder logic focused. Um, and if you know what ladder logic is, so this is the PLC. This is the, uh, the Allen Bradley PLC that we're using as part of the test. As you can see, right next to it, there's um, the device that's connected to it. In the far right, in the corner right up here, you see it, and he starts testing it. So as he starts testing it, and he starts the, the attack begins, you see right there that it goes from a state of green, green to green with red, which means it's been knocked offline. This is being done in real time, right? So that's an attack that he did with his tools. And that really is something that is you know, amazing and remarkable, because there's not a lot of people that have this. So now you can see the device is unreachable. You can't even connect to it, right? It's down. So now we start it up again. We start the PLC, and now we run a second attack. Is this interesting for you guys? Are you guys staying awake? Hopefully, right? So now the second attack is being run. And what you can see here, let me stop that. Did you see how the PLC completely went dead? Before, it had all this information. Now everything is in a state of blue. These are question marks. The PLC has effectively been killed fully. 
And this attack was not actually done by uh, using one of his scripts, because he has this script. He actually ran uh, Metasploit's tools to do it. So if you think attackers don't know how to break into control systems and do things effectively, then you're absolutely wrong. There are tools out there that are teaching them. The problem is vendors to today are using modern operating systems, and they're doing things like making Modbus ride over TCP IP, DNP3 ride over TCP IP. When you do that, you introduce vulnerabilities. When you're using modern operating systems like Linux, Microsoft, any of these, you are going to create vulnerabilities. So um, before, it was all true 64 Unix and serial-based communication. So, so if, you know, now it's not working. And so that's the video of showing you what the types of things we could have done. Now let me move over and show you our tool, right? So, and this is just showing you how I would hunt for the very, and the reason why I'm using my tools because it's my tool, right? So this is uh, um, anomaly detection that's in, our pl uh, that's in the platform that we use. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna start hunting for that activity, right? How would I, how would I start hunting it? What's interesting is, we, have ton, we, we capture every piece of metadata, so we have decoders for every protocol type out there, um, and we actually capture all information, and anything that we're not capturing live, we store it offline, the metadata for decoded protocols. And as you can see here, what I decided to do is, remember, this was an HTTP session that allowed me, when I connected, what happened was, is that I sent them the malicious email, they connected, it, it did a wget, it pulled down more files, it launched them, it put it into the, into the uh, scheduled tasks, so it's persistent. Um, now, now that I have these, uh, uh, the, all of the, and I know the attack, or I know what an attacker would do, and this is a standard process, you should be looking for this stuff in your environment. You should be looking for non-standard user agents. You should be looking for protocols that are not normal. Um, I'll tell you right now that if you're in your environment and you're looking for, if you're looking for attackers, attackers oftentimes use RC4 XOR encrypted protocols to do C2 activity. If that's not one of the protocols that you use in your environment, you better be looking it for that, because somebody is actually, gonna, is actually in your environment right now doing something they shouldn't. So hopefully that's starting to get, keep you guys awake, besides the coffee. Um, so we have 15 minutes here, so I'll, I'll be able to finish, no problem. So as you can see here, I start and I actually look for, um, look for the uh, activity based on word. I see I group, frequency grouping for hunting, which is a methodology you should be using, right? And I group how many transactions, each transaction was tied with each client that was associated with a certain file type. Now I understand the file type. Now I know which file types were associated. All of these were Word. All of these were tied to specific file sizes, and they, were, they, were, they have specific file names. Now let's go and let's take a look at the IP. Let's take a look at the second one, just because both of these are tied to drop it dot, dot, uh, a certain domain that looks interesting and there's the most amount of transactions associated with that. So adding that to the search, now we see that there's just, just this activity, right? That there's just this activity that's tied to this one IP address, so now we did frequency analysis. We looked at one IP address, we looked at a specific file type, certain file sizes, and we looked at the, and we made sure that, you know, we're also gonna make sure that, if anything, I'm gonna look for other file types. Maybe there's PDF, maybe there's zip, so I'm gonna go and check and make sure that maybe there's another file type that I did not know about. So I start the process of looking at the different file types. I add zip, I kick it off again, and I'm just gonna speed up a little bit here. Nothing happens, I don't see it. No, just MS Word, right? So now I'm gonna try PDF because I hadn't checked for that, and I see that nope, there's no, there's the only zip files and MS Word, so right now, I can, I'm gonna focus on zip files because that was the question I asked myself as my hunting hypothesis. Am I seeing a type of activity using Microsoft, uh, using people connecting with Microsoft Office applications in non-standard ways, kicking off a different service? So now let's go back and take a look at the, uh, at the, the same IP address. And as you can see, I start taking a look at all the different transactional information because this is all the metadata that we pull down when we look at the transaction. This is it, it's everything. Any type of decoded information that we can pull down using our network product, we will. Um, you can see here the, the, the content type, you can see the, the, the type of request and uh, the, the command, the HTTP command. It, you go, it goes all the way down and it shows you what was inside the actual MS Word. So as you can see here, the MS Word actually had a, a, a VBS file, which is the exact same thing I used, except I 
in, uh, I encoded it so that it wouldn't be found by any AV solution um, or gateway. So, and as you can see here, there are other files that are also being download that are being used and downloaded as part of this, right? All tied together as part of one one critical attack to give myself access, as you saw from my diagram, the C2 activity. Okay, so now let's go and validate this. And how are we going to validate this? Well, I'm going to go to the behaviors on the endpoint because network gives you visibility, but endpoint really gives you what we call the liveliness of the data. I have a friend, his name is Chris Merritt. He runs a company called Vector8. He used to he build CrowdStrike's Overwatch. And we talk about this, and he talks about liveliness. The data is lively. It gives you enough information to make a validation of some potential uh, significant activity that an attacker is, is actually doing, and that's what we want to look for. So right now, what I'm doing is, I'm going to look for, okay, I'm going to look for uh, uh, somebody that, something that kicked off a process of winword.exe, and I'm also going to look for the fact that it then created a, another process, command.exe. And uh, I'm going to apply this. I'm going to run this query for a period of time. Um, you can do, you know, daily. I, these are, by the way, these are the same hunting practices that my team, I run a team of hunters now at Fidelis, um, uh, MDR, the MDR team, uh, Managed Detection and Response. And this is what we do when we're looking. So MS Word executable starting with command.exe, right? That's important because I, that's not a normal series of behaviors that, are, that a word, word, word should never kick off. Command.exe, PowerShell, another VB script, PHP, Perl, Python, none of that. It should never kick off anything. And as you can see here, I start to go to the end of one of the individual, uh, the, the, the individual details on the process. A couple of things I want to point out uh, that I think are very cool. Um, one, you can see the command line details right here. You can see the system it came from. You can see the parent process, and you can see the command uh, parent name, right? So um, you can also see the different files that were created. Now, what's interesting here is you see this sort of strange gimme.bat file. That's a file that was downloaded as part of the initial uh, vulnerability to, to gain access. It was kicking off a bat file that would do things like run net user, um, net group, net local group to gain access, right? And then, then push that access outbound. So also running things like Plink to be able to get me a reverse SSH tunnel and a non-standard port. So, and the process tree. Right now you can see here that our tool allowed us to be able to, let me show you guys here, because I think this is very important. You should never see this. You should never see WinWord kicking off command.exe. And not only one, but two. So right here, this is something that we can almost validate that something that should not be identified within the environment. Again, we're hunting for malicious activity that was at the beginning stages of the attack that we did. And as you can also see here, you can see that another bat file was run called ransack.bat, and then the second file was the gimme.bat. So the first file that ran, and then the second file that ran. So that was the very first stage of the, of the attack. Remember, when I, when I, and this is the, that was the end of, my, of, my, of the video, but if you remember when I was showing you here, that was this step right here. So that was a step number, number two and three, three and four right here. So if I hadn't been able to gain this level of access right off the bat beginning, um, then I wouldn't have been able to get all the way to the control environment. So um, I showed you one video. Um, what are the solutions? The solutions are shifting from detection, from prevention to detection. Um, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. If, you're, if you are a person that's uh, somebody, if you see crime occurring in, in, uh, in Riga, you're not going to put more walls. You're not putting more fences. You're not tell the police is not telling everybody to buy bigger dogs unless you want to. Um, what they're doing is they're saying, oh, okay, this is happening. Let's profile this environment. Let's see what's going on. Okay, the attacker does this at 2 in the 4 in the morning. They always, leave, they always uh, break into houses or apartments that are on a street corner so that they have two points of getaway. They only do these neighborhoods in Riga because they're the wealthiest neighborhoods, right? So now we've profiled it. So we went from doing a vulnerability-centric model, which was let's put defense in depth and let's secure things and hope for the best, to an offensive model, which is let's look for this activity, let's try to identify this activity by hunting, right? So, so that's, 
that's the difference from a vulnerability-centric model to a threat-centric defense model, which is um, what I'm, I'm telling people that they should do uh, in a passive way with OT and in an active way with IT. And OT means operational technology, so control systems. Uh, so the other thing is, there's a lot of time people don't understand the terrain. Um, I, 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 was I, was, I was involved in the NERC SIP requirements, which are the critical infrastructure requirements for the United States. I provided technical feedback on protocols and, and standards usage that was tied to it. And so one of the things that was a big issue is, is that the standard for critical infrastructure protection requires you to understand your terrain. You have to know what's called the ESP, electronic security perimeter, for, or electronic security points for your environments, right? You have to understand all these things. And so you need to have some way to understand visibility. You need to have tools, like this is actually our deception tool that actually builds terrain for you. One, okay. So, and what we do is, what I'm, what I'm proposing is we use our deception tool or we use deception-like tools, honeypots, passive scanning, and really decoding everything on the network to really look at the OT environment. Because the OT environment, you won't be able to, to load EDR tools on a lot of OT, OT devices, only on maybe some of the workstations, not on the real-time databases. So you need tools that will give you a way to attract attackers, right? As you can see here, we have breadcrumbs. We have the ability to, to create decoys with different modern operating systems. We, we support OT, some OT vendors. And, um, uh, and, like Mod, uh, and like communications like Modbus, and, uh, um, and, so, and some manufacturing communications as well. And so right here, this, these are some of the, these are the bread, we, we, what we do is we tie in with the environment, we create breadcrumbs. What are breadcrumbs? Things like .ssh files, um, the web browser uh, 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 history information. All of those things are things that we use to try to entice the attacker in a dynamic way. And then we use the network information, the liveliness of the information that you just saw on the network. And then, um, as well as as much metadata, and then finally, uh, hunting for threats using the endpoint to actually validate that. So you saw examples of that with my video. You understand how this works. Um, and with that, that's the end of my presentation. I had another example of a video, but uh, I thought, I'm not, probably not gonna get to it. But if you're interested in seeing it, come and find me. Um, it's about actually hunting with uh, things like JA3 files and hunting using user agents. Um, besides that, I thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, ask them. I'm here.